and welcome to the CSUN 30 event celebrating 30 years of CSUN. And, well, and this is the first paper, paper uh, session, and uh, it's kind of this man here probably needs no introduction. How do you introduce a man that needs no introduction? And I can to pull out there. Uh, whom everybody knows from his involvement with CSUN over the last 30 years and who better to talk about 30 years of CSUN than someone who's been involved with CSUN for the duration. So, uh, Richard, thank you. Thanks Good for being morning. here. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I thought it would be nice to tell you some stories about how CSUN got started and what it was like to be there day one working with Barry Burko. The very first beeps of CSUN that were ever made, I was there making those beeps. Uh, with Barry at the Media Lab. Um, C-Sound, uh, and I even started before that. Um, my first work with uh, Barry was in 1979 with his Music 11 uh, program, and I wrote my piece Trapped and Convert that summer. Uh, Barry would throw workshops. First of all, I'm mentioning the name Barry Verko, and some of you don't know that name. So Barry Verko is a professor at MIT Media Lab started the experimental music studio there, and Barry Verko wrote C-Sound. Um, and John Fitch wrote C-Sound, and Victor Lesterini wrote C-Sound, and Lori Walsh wrote C-Sound, and um, a lot of other people, Michael Goggins contributed to and grew C-Sound, and we'll talk about those people a little bit and their contributions, how the language grew. But it really started with, in fact, Max Matthews, his music one through five, Music 4 was the language that uh, uh, C sound really grew out of. Um, and um, uh, it started with, you know, kind of their friendship and their relationship. And uh, in fact, C sound has a long history of being built out of uh, really great relationships and great friendships. This is Max Matthews and Barry Verko uh, together. Um, Barry was fascinated by the C programming language and Unix. And um, uh, in fact, even though Max Matthews was at Bell Labs, where Unix was developed and uh, sort of invented or written, um, Barry Verko is the one who taught Max Matthews to program in C. And Max taught me to program in C. And so did Barry a little bit when we were debugging uh, a C sound together. Um, and, well, he was debugging and I was coming up with the bugs. We were using my piece, Track and Convert, that I had written uh, in that summer of 1979 on a PDP-11 computer in the Experimental Music Studio as a kind of test case for CSAM. And included with that, we were also using a set of example files that Barry had collected over the years by some of his students, these test files. They actually are part of my C sound catalog and led to the first collection of C sound instruments that was distributed. Not quite as good as the McCurdy collection right now, which we're all learning from and loving. But what I did over many years was collect anything and everything that was done with C sound, try to organize it, preserve it, correct it, debug it, feed it into various versions of C sound running on various platforms. Um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about Barry and about those days and what a great man he is and a great mentor he was and a great supporter he was for me and for all of us in computer music. Um, that summer, he would have these summer workshops at the Experimental Music Studio and I wanted to just show you quickly what that Experimental Music Studio looked like. Um, there's this little video here. Um, just for a second, this is the crew, this is Steve Hafflick, who did a lot of the systems work, there's the PDP-11, and this is Barry Verko, back then, and do very, very fine-grained uh, computation on the evolution of Tandas. Always, of course, under composer's control. So I'm just going to stop here. There's Barry, and this is how we worked in 1979 on a deck station. This very sexy graphic front end for C Sound, then Music 11. The languages looked the same, they were different under the hood. Uh, Music 11 was written in RT11 assembly language, very, very fast. Barry's whole thing was about speed. C Sound was the fastest. 
And in fact, our, our friendship grew and continued as a digression, which I'll fill in later. I was doing my PhD at CARL, the Computer Audio Research Lab in San Diego, UC San Diego. And there was a PDP-11 sitting in the back room there. Barry came and visited. So then Richard pulled me aside. Said, oh, why don't I install Music 11 on there? You can race them. You can race the VAX 11780 running Dick Moore's C music language against Barry's C sound and see what's just running faster. And there's always a thing, and truly, C sound survives partly because it was so fast, partly because it was so efficient and so efficiently written. And it was ahead of its time, given that it was written in C, that it was portable. Um, uh, but it, it started. Yeah, and it, its history is chronicled really beautifully in, in Victor's new book, the new C sound book, right in the opening, quite beautifully. So I recommend you all check that out. I think you can even read that chapter for free online at Springer. Um, so I was sitting at this terminal in that summer of 1979. I had been at Colgate University working on Music 10 a little before that, um, and uh, you know, making sounds all summer. Uh, and um, uh, what was neat was um, uh, the way Barry's workshops worked was um, he had, um, it was uh, like four weeks. And the first two weeks, there were 30 of us, um, 10 composers and 20 engineers. So I was there with the heads of analog devices and, and the head of different synthesizer companies and electronics companies. And they were all there learning about hardware and all the latest uh, uh, things and learning a little of the language. But then the composers, the 10 of us, were commissioned to stay around and spend the next two weeks composing a piece. There was a concert schedule, big concert reviewed in all the Boston papers in Kresge Auditorium. And we all were scrambling to write a piece. Uh, for that concert to be premiered at the end of the summer. Um, I was fortunate because I took the night shift. The composers split up, because we're all sharing this little PDP-11 computer. And uh, you saw it at the beginning there. I have a really great picture uh, of it here. Um, so here's what the PDP-11 looked like, a, a refrigerator with these tape drives and um, switches down below. And this was the main computer. And here's what I also found which just blew me away. Check it out. <laughs> so when you're thinking how cool it is to have a Raspberry Pi that runs C sound, costs you maybe $35, $45. The fact of the matter is you can get a PDP-11 for $49. It'll still run Music 11. Barry will send you the, 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 the mag tape. And, uh, and you could run some of those. Some of the C sound pieces will still run on this machine. So the, it's fantastic. It's full circle. And that's a little bit of what this talk is about. This isn't Barry Verco. This is me. That's my ARP 2600. And this is Alan R. Perlman, the head of ARP. Um, Alan Perlman commissioned my first symphony when I was 18. And I had this ARP, which my sister gave me the money to buy because my parents didn't want me learning electronic music. I was studying classical music. And I had to borrow the money from my sister to buy a synthesizer because I thought electronic music was important. Why I show you this is because it was this machine that I had in my mind the whole time I'm sitting there at that terminal saying, boy, if I could make an envelope generator that did this, if I could have three more filters that did this, if I could have seven oscillators, I could barely afford this with three oscillators. By the way, I still have this machine. This is me now. Alan's still alive. He and I are still collaborating. And in fact, I, in my piece tomorrow night, I'll be playing a C sound in modular synthesizers in real time, complete full circle. But it was this vision with Alan Perlman. And by the way, Alan was in the class with me. He was in the first half of the class. And so funny, you know, he's getting a little older now, right? He's 92. And he's still inventing new modules. And I was at his house like last week, and he said, you know, Richard, I was thinking of that language of Barry Verko's. Now wait, I've given him the C sound book. It's sitting right in front of him. I was thinking of that language. And imagine if we wrote a program that would control the synthesizer. Like, you know, I could use a program like Barry's with a note list to control the ARPs. And I was saying, yeah, Alan, I think that's possible. And that would be really cool. And well, you want to do it in C sound? That's good too. I know something about that. But 
it's, it's really neat the way it's all coming together and still coming together. That's where my ideas started, and that's what all sort of happened in 79. Now, in 79, I was introduced that summer to Max Matthews. And um, this is Max at Bell Labs. And um, I was told that summer, well, I finished the piece, and I was telling you about the night shift. The night shift went like this. I started at 11 p.m., and I had to get off the computer at 6 a.m. But half of the 10 composers were not there at 6 a.m. They were out partying and with their friends, like most normal young adults would do. And so they only showed up at 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. And so I actually got like three, four, five more hours a day on the machine to make sounds and make these textures and finish my piece. And uh, um, it was pretty great. The, 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 the coolest thing is uh, ultimately, and we'll fill in the story in this way, and then I'll, I'll come back. You know, Barry taught me C-Sound. And what it was like that summer, we would sit in these labs at MIT. It wasn't the um, media lab then, because it wasn't open. It was the Experimental Music Studio. But we'd be down in these buildings on Ames Street. And the walls were covered with whiteboard. And Barry's class, his lecture, would consist of him filling the whiteboard all the way around the room for four, five, six hours. I have these all on cassette tape. Um, and, uh, and, and writing about how the oscillator works, how the ring modulator works, how the soft code works, and he would just, but, as you notice, I speak loudly. Barry Verko speaks like this. And so then the, we'll take the, the waveform from the oscillator and we'll multiply by the square root of the five. Very softly, facing the whiteboard, while he was writing all day, we're all just like, what's he saying? How's it work? How's it? It's crazy hard. Um, and in fact, he had a manual for Music 11, which I have, and many of us have seen. We've published it in some of our books. I think we published it with the audio programming book, Victor and I do. And um, oh, the manual was a godsend. It had little instruments. But it was that manual that I kept saying, Barry, but it doesn't really teach you how to do it or what it does. It's so hard to figure out. There needs to be a book. This is what inspired ultimately the C-Sound book, which I started with Barry, by the way. We were co-authoring the C-Sound book at the beginning, at Analog Devices with John Fitch. We'll come to that part of the story in a minute, too. Um, but th there was a manual, and that gave us some clues about how to get started. Um, Barry would always say about his manual the following, and I don't know if I've already told you this story, but he would always say, Richard, it's not a tutorial. It's a reference manual. It's to remind me, meaning Baron, how the stuff works if I forget. It was like his cliff notes. And if any of you saw those original manuals, they followed the Unix uh, style, which was well, every manual, every opcode or whatever, every program in Unix should only have one page. The manual should only be one page long for each program. So Barry followed that rule too, which meant that if you're trying to translate Oh, this is how I think oscillators work on my ARP. To how this oscill works in C sound, you had a hard time. And I had a hard time. And it's been the greatest hard time. It's been 30 years of a hard time trying to figure out how these things work and discovering how they work and making mistakes and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and learning along the way. And, and that's the thrill of C sound. The thrill is that all of us who are using it are constantly learning and sharing what we learn. And that was Barry's thing. So Barry was kind of inviting us there. Max Matthews, as I said, was his bud. And um, uh, so that summer I met Max, it was amazing. And I also uh, met a few other composers. And they said to me, hey, um, uh, uh, you know what, Richard? You're, I was just getting through my master's degree. Um, you ought to consider San Diego. They've got money. They've got a new lab there. And Dick Moore is there. So Dick Moore, the other person, we, we, Victor and I dedicated our audio programming book to Barry Verko, father of CSAM, to Dick Moore, the father of C music, and Max Matthews, the father of all of it, music one through music five. So it turned out Dick's, Dick Moore ended up being my thesis advisor. I went to San Diego. But then that's what got me back to hanging out with Barry Verko, because Barry would sneak out to San Diego every now and then to visit. And it was like, 
Richard, you got that PDP-11, it's not doing anything. How's it going? So he and I would always stay in secret touch because I had the PDP-11 to myself in the back room, in the computer room at Carl, and I was messing around with it and still working on Trapped. This four minute piece I worked on for 15 and a half years, you know what I mean? Just trying to make it just right or not right. Or, and I think we probably all do that a little bit with C-Sound too, where we're always kind of just making changes. And I don't know, I think there's something about that that we love. You know, it's like guys who want to fix up in hot rod cars or whatever, always fixing a little bit of it. In any case, um, so I met Max then. Max's violin turns out to be an important instrument. You see him there with it, his electronic Stradivarius. A lot of nice things came together. And uh, I ended up doing my PhD. I had written Trap with Barry in the PDP-11 machine. And I finished my PhD, and I don't know about you guys who have advanced degrees yet, but there's nothing worse than having a PhD because you are the smartest person in the world about one thing and dumb about everything else. And you can only be hired by that one place that wants the smartest person in that one thing, which is harder than hell to find. Which meant it's tough to find a job. It was tough to find a job after my PhD. So I went home. I was in California, I went back to Massachusetts and uh, wrote and did some freelancing work and gave some lectures and Barry hired me and invited me to come to the Media Lab. Now, it took me a year to get my job at the Berklee College of Music. I've been there now for 30 years. Um, but in that one year, I was at MIT. The Media Lab had just opened. I had nowhere to go. I was the smartest dummy on the planet. And uh, uh, Barry, I would meet with him every morning, 6 a.m., 5 a.m., so I'd get up at the crack of dawn, drive an hour and a half to Boston, try to as hell, hard as hell to park, and hang out with him learning from him, working the language. And there was no one at the media lab at that point. It was just opened up. So there was lots of space and lots of cubbies and cubicles. I had the combo. He gave me security. Everyone knew that I was there. I was sort of like an invited you know, artist in residence or whatever. I don't think I put any of those titles on my resume because as I would suggest to any of you who are still students, don't inflate your resume with stuff because people see that and, and, it's, and, and they just put your resume away. So you don't need to. But um, I was there, Barry invited me. I'll tell you one of his most important shared secrets at that time. Although I don't think he drinks coffee now. But we'd start our day with coffee every morning and he'd take me downstairs to the floor where they had the like, coffee pots and stuff like this at the lab. And I'd see him always putting like two or three filters in the pot. And I thought that was rather wasteful, you know? Like he'd put two filters and then the drip. And then he said to me, and this is important to make sure we get this historically, because Max Matthews has a power breakfast, which explains his genius. Karma at Stanford, they have this espresso pot that explains the whole field of computer music. That damn coffee pot at Stanford, it broke. Nothing happened at Stanford after that, once the coffee pot went down. But uh, Max has a power breakfast. Barry Verko had the power coffee thing. Both Barry and Max are what I like to refer to as coffee achievers. And that's what Max Matthews referred to himself as a coffee achiever. So you layer the filters two or three deep. And this is the whole reason I wanted to give the talk, just to tell you guys the secret about the coffee. And forget, I don't have to tell you anything else. To... You layer the filters two or three deep, coffee grounds. The water takes longer to drip through, according to Barry, scientific at the moment. And so the coffee is stronger and more powerful. And so, boom, op codes are written, bugs are squashed. So, so the neat thing is, here we are in 1985 back at the lab, and it's like, well, Richard, let's, I'm, I'm writing this new language. Now, I didn't know the whole backstory, and I don't know if you know the backstory, but I'd like you to know why and how C-Sound was created. I only learned it over time. I learned it at Analog Devices when I was there working on another C-Sound project with, with Barry, and I was working on that with John Fitch, and we were also working on that with Barry's son, Scotty. I taught Scotty Virgo C-Sound which is kind of an honor, and Barry taught me. And um, I always like to think it brought those guys closer together. You know, you can't learn something from your dad. Oh, you're gonna teach me how to, I'll learn how to, uh, I can do that myself. But, you know, they became very close in that analog devices period. And I would go with Barry and sons of great virtual jazz pianists. We'd go to clubs and listen to Scotty play, and it was a blast, traveled a bit. But it was Scotty who helped me understand the story. Barry, 
if you even read in the, the, the uh, foreword of the CSAM book, Barry writes at the very end of that in my book um, something about, well, I just feel so sad that I'm so great that Richard wrote this book, but I'm so sad for all the composing he didn't get to do and he won't get to do. Because Barry traded his incredible compositional life and skills for writing this software for us, programming and all of that. He, he made that trade-off and stopped composing. And he had written a masterpiece. It was what I had heard in, uh, in the 70s, uh, Synapse for Viola, and written other major works. He was a 12-tone composer whose 12-tone music had beautiful harmonies, passionate melodies. It was like there weren't that many 12-tone composers who could write serial music that had a soul. And Barry was one of them. And so his music was wonderful. And so finally, C Sound was, I mean, Music 11 was in a pretty good place. And he got a Guggenheim or something like this, and forgive me for picking the wrong grant, but some major grant to go to Earcom and compose. And he went to Earcom and he started working on his synthetic performer system. Almost like Tarmo was talking about earlier, about following and score following. And he was dealing with all this. And he wrote the synthetic performer system with Larry Beauregard at Earcom. And Larry was the famous flute virtuoso in Boulez's Ensemble Intercontemporain. And he worked with Barry, and they worked together on the clock. Here's a little tiny video just so you see it. Because, by the way, C Sound exists because of Larry He's Beauregard. In one of the studios at Aircom in Paris. I'm Barry Berger from the MIT Experimental Music Studio. This to my right is Larry Bargard, the flute from the Boulez Ensemble on the Contemporary. The problem we're dealing with is that of relating live performance to computer processed sound. It's Tarbo's lecture, right? <laughs> I want to say two things about that. But so Barry was working on this problem, and he working with Larry. They were developing an incredible system of score following and tracking. Larry had his flute all wired, all the contacts, and, and it was hooked up to a Zone PDP-11 or something. At Earcom, the flute was being tracked, and, and he was doing some amazing things in software to create um, a better synchronized music. Barry was a huge fan and even collaborator with Mario Davidowski. And so he wanted to make these synchronisms uh, again. Synapse was like that, but Synapse, Marcus Thompson would just follow along. He wanted a system that kind of synchronized and the computer would follow, an intelligent computer performer, which he achieved. But the problem was that, and the piece was coming along, many people, I have heard the piece. I've heard excerpts from the piece, and it is epic. I hope someday Barry releases the piece. But Larry Beauregard died. Colon cancer or something terrible. It was a tragic death. The guy was super young. He was going to come to MIT and do a PhD. He was going to work with Barry, start his own little ensemble, uh, contemporary at MIT. Barry had all kinds of dreams. Miller Puckett was there. Miller Puckett wrote Max MSP to work with the synthetic performer. So Max was written as a graphical front end for C Sound to allow this kind of interaction. Okay. Barry came out of Earcom. He was so depressed and so wrecked about Larry's death that he went back to his language and he just wrote, started writing season. They had a vax at the media lab and so he just went back into his own little... And Barry's face, John Fitch will attest to this too, you know, he had a very big office, big corner office, but also even in his home, a whole room of the house, a big room, third the size of this, is dedicated to like his programming space. And there are just tables everywhere, and all the code is laid out on pages with little red markings like, okay, I finished that, I fixed that, there's a bug on this line. His code is all over his workspace. And that's what it was like at the media lab, and that's what it's like in his home, with his language. But he came back, and coincidentally, that's when I came back out of my PhD. And it was like, oh, Richard, come. Well, I'm doing something. Well, you can try running your trap piece with the language. He listened to this oral history recording that's been floating around. Stephen Yee shared it with some of us on the C-Sound list a little while ago. 
Uh, Barry talks about the fact that, well, I really didn't do much of anything. All I did was throw away the assembly language and compile my comments. And that's how I got the language to work. And then he found bugs, and we found the bugs in there. And, and, uh, um, and it was a really exciting time to bring track back to life on this new system in this new language. And uh, I know that's how it started. In fact, I have a, a name up here, Anthony Davis, because you know Barry, like I said, hired me. So he would bring in these composers to the Media Lab, Rizé, Anthony Davis, Black Jazz, uh, a contemporary composer. And I, at, at UC San Diego, worked a lot with the phase vocoder and sound file convolution. And so I was brought in to spend a, a year working with Anthony Davis on his commission work and doing all kinds of phase vocoder things for his ensemble. So, you know, he kept, kept us you know, kind of there and working and involved. And um, while, uh, while we were there, um, uh, well, like I said, the manual was an issue. Um, but it was especially an issue, it might not have been an issue for someone like John Fitch who likes the language text lay out languages like this. But, because uh, I write, John, don't you use languages like, when you're laying out with LaTeX, when you're laying out mathematical documents, what's your favorite language for laying out? Right, see? But, you mean there's no term? Yeah, I see, I know, there's a problem. But a guy like me, and maybe some of you, was like Microsoft Word or whatever, you know, we look for a word. So the manual wasn't in a, lang in a, a, a program that lots of average musicians could share. I cashed in like my life insurance, bought a scanner, a little portable scanner, spent the entire spring break scanning and correcting the reference manual so that it could ultimately be in Microsoft Word and share. I started csounds.com so that I could share csound at the time. And in fact, I met John Fitch. This was around 1990. We met as internet pen pals. And, um, uh, actually, we met through a guy named Dennis Miller, who I was giving private lessons to. He was a professor at North, Northeastern University. I'd go to his house on Wednesday nights and give him lessons and see sound and help him do his programming. And, and uh, he had, I don't know, he had met John or something. And this company, Microtechnology Unlimited, were making a DAC and a uh, converter box. And um, Dennis uh, convinced them that I could write some tutorials so I would get the box. And he put me in touch with John, and John said, yeah, I think I could probably compile C-Sound so that it would work on a PC, and so that it would work on a Macintosh. And so John sort of took Barry's code, and in a weekend, I think, he had it working on a PC and on a Mac. So this began our collaboration for many years, around which csounds.com grew up, and that was the way of sharing C-Sound for many, many years because of the licensing problem. There was a licensing issue. Um, that licensing issue was, if you read the original license on the manuals for CSound, it said CSound could only be used for educational use only. And so our problem was, um, okay, well, um, uh, what if I, my students want to use it in a television show? What if we want to use it in a film score? And we were all excited because some of them were starting to do that. Um, well, how would we, how could we deal with that? So, for many years, Barry wouldn't address the issue. But he did let me distribute CSound. John prepared it, and csounds.com would distribute it. So for a long time, that was how we got out to the community. But then, as more and more pressure came from developers, like Michael Goggins especially, but as Victor and people were starting to really add to the language a lot and repair a lot of things, they started getting a little worried, like, okay, wait a minute. I just added these opcodes. I just fixed this. Is this mine, or is it MIT's? Or does it belong to, who does it belong to? There was a lot of controversy, and I was really excited because I brought that controversy to Barry. And I sat down with him and said, look, Barry, you, you, we're losing these developers. They're really helping. You know. And it turned out 
that we contacted the licensing office at MIT, and in fact, they were happy to change the license. They were excited to make it open, you know, uh, LGPL and, and, and open source. So we ultimately were able to kind of move the language, we were able to move the language uh, uh, into open source, and that has led to where the community now is able to kind of take over and, and do all kinds of wonderful things with it. Now, um, we got involved with analog devices. Barry, there are two more projects I want to tell you about. Um, so every now and then, about every four or five years, Barry would call me and involve me in some other project. The moment was in analog devices. And again, when he calls me, then I call John Fitch, or, uh, and, and we contact all of our friends in the community and, and, and bring them on board as well. And so we got involved with uh, analog devices, um, where we were trying to make uh, a version of C-Sound run with the Shark processor. And um, here we are at, at Analog. And um, so Analog paid us a lot of money to work on it uh, and come up with a new version. This is Robert Cooper. He's the guy I dedicated the C-Sound book to. Uh, a great teacher, computer musician. We involved him on some projects. He passed away right as the book was coming out. Had a massive heart attack. and, and uh, and we lost him, but um, here's all of us kind of working together at, at, uh, at ADI on that, uh, on that project. And that project led to some really interesting developments. Barry went off with his own version of the language at that point. The R community, the, the, the public CSAM community started to grow and, and, and develop uh, uh, the language there. That brought us to... Um, uh, a really nice uh, uh, big project that Barry had me on, again, which was the One Laptop Per Child project. And some of you were involved on, on that project as well. And um, in between that One Laptop Per Child, um, you know, Matt Ingalls made um, Maxi Sound. Right, a nice front end for C Sound for a while, and and that got us going. This is what CSounds.com looked like at the time, and that's Matt Angles at the time, and that sort of got us going with um, uh, uh, bringing C Sound to you know more commercial musicians and and more students, at least in my circle. Um, uh, Matt Angles also was responsible for the C Sound tilde object that worked in Max MSP for a while, and it was David Siccarelli who kind of uh, showed, showed Matt what to do uh, to get that guy going, uh, but Matt was very important. Um, another, uh, well, we know John's very important. Uh, we know that Victor is super important in terms of the carrying on of uh, uh, C sound. Um, Max and I became very good friends and, and, and worked on a lot of things. Uh, um, and uh, uh, but he would come and, and uh, visit Barry and I two or three times a year. He would stay at my house for a week and at Barry's house for a week. And we would do things together. We would all collaborate on, on different projects. And um, uh, up until Max's passing, that uh, uh, was also very important. and. Um, let me see where I wanted to take you for the final thing. I will end by saying that um, one, Barry was happy that we've gone where we've gone with CSAM. One of the most fun things was one semester, and he would hire me to come back and lecture two or three lectures every semester at the MIT Media Lab for his class and show them the latest C sound, get them uh, going with it. Um, he, um, I think he's always been very happy with where we went with it. He still has his own version, which he knows and loves, and it's still spread out on tables uh, everywhere. 
um, uh, uh, that he's uh, uh, using. I don't think he's particularly active uh, now uh, with it too much, although his version does run some software on the $100 laptops, which he's still spreading around the world uh, and uh, uh, trying to empower kids. His focus now is more on education. But to reiterate, um, it grew out of a relationship or a friendship between Max Matthews, Barry Verko, and Larry Beauregard. RC Sound grew out of a friendship between John Fitch and Richard Boulanger and Victor Lazzarini. And your C Sound will grow out of wonderful relationships built right in this room between all of you and, uh, and your students. And uh, so, thank you.